Good morning. Welcome to Clare in the name of our King and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the special time of praise, prayer and proclamation of the Word of God. I greet especially those from Ahori, Clare and Vinnie Cash Presbyterian Churches, but indeed I greet everyone who may be listening. At the outset, I would like to thank Paul Reader for all his help with the filming and also the Sanford, Mason and Burns families for the leading of the praise. This morning, we're going to continue our guided tour through the book of Revelation. Uh, the tour is entitled The Lamb Wins after the title of a commentary by Richard Muse. We turn this morning to chapters 12 through 14 to celebrate the victory of Christ. So please turn with me in your Bibles uh, to Revelation chapter 12 in readiness for the recommencement of our tour. Before, however, we go any further, let us pray together. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? There is none like you. Our triune God, you are in a league of your own. And we love you. Sovereign Lord, we love your glory. Righteousness and truth, we praise. You alone, our God, are worthy to receive the song we raise. Angels sing your matchless grandeur, face to face, by glory awed. Gladly we bow down before you and by faith proclaim you, Lord. Amen. Sovereign Lord, we sing your glory. Our thanks to Trevor and Heather Sanford from Ahori, who will now lead us in praise. Good morning, Good morning everyone. everybody. Wherever you are, do join in with these beautiful words. Sing along and enjoy it.
Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives, even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where is she where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Well, here we go again. In our chapters this evening, we're invited to watch from yet another camera angle, the movie of the story of the world between the first and second coming of Christ. These chapters contain the fourth main vision in the book and they prompt us to see everything in an even deeper way than in those we've read already. In chapters 1 through 11 we saw the conflict between the church and the world. In chapters 12 through 22 we'll see that underlying this conflict is the even deeper conflict between the Christ and the dragon. The curtain is pulled back more fully than ever before so that we are led to see more clearly than ever before the victory of the Lamb. In verses 1 through 6, John introduces us to the three main characters. First, in verse 1, there is a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. This light-bearing woman, reminiscent of the image presented in Genesis chapter 37, verse 9, represents the church of God, stretching from Old Testament days into New Testament days. The second character, introduced in verse 3, 
is a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his heads seven diadems. This bloodthirsty monster is Satan, God's arch enemy. His seven crowned heads and ten horns indicate worldwide dominion and destructive power. He attacks the stars, symbols of God's government. But his power is limited. Only a third of them are cast down to earth. The third character, identified in verse 5, is a male child. One who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. He is the Christ, the serpent crushing, dragon thrashing seed of the woman. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, God said to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. As soon as Satan heard those words in the garden, he trembled and sought to do all that he could to stop this child being born. He put it into Cain's heart to kill Abel. He corrupted earth's people so much that God sent the flood. He spurred on Pharaoh to oppress the Israelites. He did all he could through war and through exile to end the royal line of David. But God frustrated him at every step along the way. He gave Seth to Adam and Eve. He raised up righteous Noah. He redeemed his people out of Egypt. He saw to it that the royal line of David continued. Herod the Great, directed by Satan, did his murderous best 2,000 years ago when Jesus, the greater, was born. The Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. Satan, along with his demonic and human agents, threw everything at him. But no one and nothing could stop him living and dying and rising again. No one and nothing could stop him ascending to God and to his throne, there to reign forever. The Christ is victorious, the dragon frustrated, the church secure. In verses 7 through 12, we see the same story, the same events, only this time more from the vantage point of heaven. In Richard Bue's words, we are looking at the video recording of the winning goal all over again, but from a different camera position. John sees the godly angels led by the archangel Michael. You can read about him in Daniel chapter 12, going on the offense against the dragon and his angels. When Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead and ascended to his heavenly throne, the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. The accuser of the brothers was thrown down. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, you see, something momentous happened in the heavenly places. The ruler of this world was cast out John chapter 12. Satan fell from heaven like lightning, Luke chapter 10. And the evil rulers and authorities were disarmed and put to open shame, Colossians chapter 2. The deceiver's deceptions no longer do the trick, for the gospel goes to all the nations. And the accuser's accusations no longer hold any weight, for there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The Christ is victorious, the dragon expelled, the church triumphant. In verses 12 through 17, however, we see that the dragon is still a dragon. He has already been vanquished, but he has not yet been destroyed. 
the evil dictator has been ousted from his capital. But as he makes for the border, as he runs for his life, he is in a deadly rage. And so, in this time between the first and second coming of the Lord, various de described for us here in apocalyptic fashion as three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days, or a time and times and half a time, the church, while triumphant, will experience hostility. In the words of verses 12 and 13, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. He can no longer touch Christ, but he does everything that he can to attack Christians. As someone has said, to be in heaven's hall of fame, you have to be on hell's bulletin board. Satan attacks through deception. See the water pouring out of his mouth in verse 15. And through persecution. See him furiously making war in verse 17. But the very creation comes to the church's aid in verse 16. And in verse 14 she is rescued in exodus-like fashion with the two wings of the great eagle. The dragon is enraged but the church is protected because the Christ is triumphant. It is true that Satan is way, way stronger than us. As the Apostle Paul said to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, we wrestle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But it is also true that Christ is way, way stronger than Satan. And if we are believers, we are on his side. In the beautiful words of verse 11, and they, weak, tiny people, just like me, have conquered him, the great dragon, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. They have conquered him. Richard Buse is absolutely right when he says this. Christians should never think of themselves as those working towards victory. Rather, they are those who work and witness for God from the position of victory already achieved. This is true. We are on the victory side. If God is for us, who can be against us? He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. The Christ is victorious. The Lamb wins. Let's pause to reflect prayerfully on what we have heard together. Let mortal tongues attempt to sing the wars of heaven when Michael stood chief general of the eternal king and fought the battles of our God. Against the dragon and his host, the armies of the Lord prevail. In vain they rage, in vain they boast. Their courage sinks, their weapons fail. Down to the earth was Satan thrown. Down to the earth his legions fell. Then was the trump of triumph blown and shook the dreadful deeps of hell. Now is the hour of darkness past. Christ has assumed his reigning power. Behold, the great accuser cast down from the skies to rise no more. T'was by thy blood, immortal lamb, thine armies trod the tempter down. T'was by thy word and powerful name they gained the battle and renown. Rejoice, ye heavens, 
Let every star shine with new glories round the sky. Saints, while ye sing the heavenly war, raise your deliverer's name on high. O victorious Christ, we do raise your name on high. Yours is the mighty conquest. And through you, hallelujah, we too are more than conquerors. May our lives be all praise. Amen. Let mortal tongues attempt to sing. Isaac Watts, the hymn writer of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, wrote a hymn based on Revelation chapter 12. It isn't well known at all, but it is epic and we're going to sing it to the well-known tune before the throne of God above. Let mortal tongues attempt to sing. Let's praise the Lord. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. 
Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Every one whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make, for an, ima make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who is understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. The dragon cannot accept reality. He has been conquered by the Christ, but as we saw at the end of chapter 12, he stands on the sand of the sea, furiously determined to attack the church with every weapon in his arsenal. He does not remain on his own for long. He enlists two great allies and inspires many devoted followers. The first ally is introduced to us in verses 1 through 10. I say introduced, but we've actually met him before in chapter 11, verse 7. There he rose from the bottomless pit. Here he rises out of the sea. He is a hideous beast, reminiscent of Leviathan, Job chapter 41, and also of the four beasts in Daniel chapter 7. Notice how the dragon tries to counterfeit God the Father. By engaging in a kind of mock creation. It is from the waters. Remember Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. That the beast rises. And notice moreover how the beast is a counterfeit of the eternal son. As the son is the image of the father. So the beast is the image of the dragon. He has ten horns and seven heads like the dragon. As the son is crowned, so the beast is crowned. As the father delegates authority to the son, so the dragon delegates authority to the beast. As the son died and rose, so the beast seemed to have a mortal wound that was healed. As the son is worshipped by those from every tribe and people and language and nation, so the beast is worshipped by those from every tribe and people and language and nation and so on. You see what's going on here? As the dragon is a deformed counterfeit of God the Father, even so the beast is a deformed counterfeit of God the Son. But what does he represent? Well, the sea in the Old Testament often symbolizes the hostility of the nations and their kings. And the beasts of Daniel chapter 7 represent empires. So the first beast, the beast from the sea, is a political animal. He represents anti-Christian persecution. The oppressive power of anti-Christian governments. Rome is primarily in, in view here. 
uh, the first century Christians, the first readers and hearers of this letter, of this book, would have thought, no doubt, of the legend of Nero, the emperor returning from the dead. Uh, they would have thought of Domitian, the emperor, blasphemously calling himself a Dominus et Deus Noster, our Lord and our God. But every anti-Christian government in this age is represented by this monster. Here indeed is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. The second ally of the dragon is introduced in verses 11 through 18. He also is a beast. Rising out of the earth, he reminds us of Behemoth in Job chapter 40. Except that he looks like a lamb. Cute, cuddly, friendly, a pet for children. Listen, however, to his voice. He speaks like a dragon, perhaps even the dragon. We're reminded of Paul's words, surely, in 2 Corinthians 11. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. This beast is a servant of the dragon and of the first beast. He is in fact the propagandist, the public relations officer of the first beast. In chapter 16, verse 13, he will be called the false prophet. And indeed that is a fitting title. For he represents false teaching false religion. If the first beast represented anti-Christian persecution, Satan's hand, the second beast represents anti-Christian religion, Satan's mind. The first century Christians, upon hearing of the first beast, would have thought of the persecuting imperial government. Upon hearing of the second beast, they would have thought of the idolatrous imperial cult. Uh, they would have thought of the priests demanding the citizens on pain of death to burn incense before the statue of the emperor and to confess Caesar as Lord and God. The second beast then is every bit as dangerous as the first. And he is, when you stop to think about it, Nothing less than a deformed counterfeit of God the Holy Spirit. As God the Spirit glorifies God the Son, so the second beast glorifies the first. As God the Spirit works miracles to promote the claims of God the Son, so the second beast works miracles to promote the claims of the first. As God the Spirit causes followers of God the Son to be sealed, so the second beast causes followers of the first to be branded, to be marked, and, and so on. You see what's going on here? As the dragon is a deformed counterfeit of God the Father, and as the first beast is a deformed counterfeit of God the Son, even so the second beast, or the false prophet, is a deformed counterfeit of God the Holy Spirit. The dragon, the beast, from the sea and the beast from the land, thus form a kind of unholy trinity, an evil alliance in defiance of the living and true God, the holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All this is greatly sobering, is it not? Satan's political and religious allies in our world are forces to be reckoned with. Here's the thing. There are billions of people, however, in the world today, maybe even some of you listening to this right now, who are in the grip of this evil without even realizing it. Satan is a great red dragon. And his political and religious allies are beasts but they seldom show their true colors. Sure, there are cases of demon possession. 
There are North Korean despots. There are openly hostile, atheistic preachers. But there are also glamorized Halloween celebrations and marriage redefining governments that claim for themselves powers that they do not possess and seemingly harmless children's TV programs that filter lies into young minds. Our most basic assumptions and thoughts and actions are shaped in more powerfully subtle ways than we dare to imagine. But in Revelation, Satan and his two allies are unmasked, that we might see them for what they truly are and oppose them with all our might. The good news is that they are fully under the control of the sovereign God and that their days are numbered. The number of the first beast, the beast, the beast from the sea, reminds us of this. It is the number of incompleteness, the number of a mere man, always six, 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 never seven, seven, seven. Failure upon failure is all ultimately that Satan and his allies know. Why? The lamb, the lamb wins. Let's pause to reflect prayerfully on what we have just heard. And though the world seems full of ill, with hungry demons prowling, Christ's victory is with us still. We need not fear their howling. The tyrants of this age strut briefly on the stage. Their sentence has been passed. We stand unharmed at last. A word from God destroys them. Our triune God, we rejoice that you stand supreme. No unholy alliance could ever seize your throne or thwart your plan. May we contend with your enemies and may we do so with the assurance that one little word shall fell them. And that little word is Jesus. Amen. Our God stands like a fortress rock. Martin Luther wrote the tune and the words and together they powerfully reinforce the message of Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 13. Our thanks to the Mason family from Clare, John, Helen, Nalili, Caleb and Joshua, who will now lead us in praise. <laughs>
Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God, and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle, and another angel came out of the altar, From the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. We live in a kind of twilight in some respects. There are shades of grey everywhere to our eyes, but ultimately everything is either black or white and will be revealed as such. Chapter 13 reminds us of this and compels us all to choose this day whom we will serve. Will we side with the dragon or will we side with the lamb? There are only two sides, only two destinies. In the welcome interlude of verses 1 through 5, we see the lamb standing in God's presence with his people. The 144,000, the entire church, set apart in purity, triumphant and exultant. They sing a new song, a victory song, a song in which, as William Hendrickson, the commentator says, the majestic and the tender, the sublime and the lovely are beautifully combined. The lamb wins, and they know it. 
In verses 6 through 11, three angels deliver messages that need to be heard. The first calls on us all to fear God and to give him the glory, to repent and believe the gospel. The second announces the certain destruction of Babylon the Great, the prostitute about whom we will hear more later in the book. He is the evil counterfeit of the woman, the bride, the church. She represents the corrupt civilization and seductive materialism of the world, but her days are numbered. The third angel warns of the curse of eternal punishment that will fall on all who remain on the side of the dragon and his allies. In verses 12 and 13, believers are given an encouragement not to cave in, but rather to persevere because joy and glory await. Finally, in verses 14 through 20, we're given two complementary pictures of the day of judgment. The centre, as ever, is the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one appointed by God to judge the world, to judge the living and the dead at the last day. Some commentators say that the first harvest, the grain harvest, in verses 14 through 16, is that of believers, while the second, the grape harvest, is that of unbelievers. Uh, They point to texts such as Matthew 3 verse 12, where the wheat is gathered while the chaff is burned. And Matthew 13, 37 through 39, where the wheat and weeds are separated. Other commentators, however, say that the two harvests are complementary pictures of the judgment and punishment of unbelievers. Uh, They suggest that Joel 3 verse 13, for instance, is in view, where both the grapes and the grain represent the wicked. Put in the sickle, Joel says, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. I incline towards this second view. You can read the scriptures and come to your own mind. The main point in any case here is crystal clear. Those on the side of the dragon will be everlastingly cursed, while those on the side of the lamb will be everlastingly blessed. None of us is neutral. There are only two sides. There are only two destinies. Therefore, with the authority that God has granted to a preacher of his holy word, I exhort you today, choose this day whom you will serve. Choose this day whom you will serve. Is it going to be the dragon? Or is it going to be the lamb? Choose this day whom you will serve. Choose wisely, for the Lamb wins. Shall we pray together? We turn into prayer the words of the answer to question 52 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Heavenly Father, in all our sorrow and persecution, we lift up our heads and eagerly await as judge from heaven the very same person who before has submitted himself to your judgment for our sake and has removed all the curse from us, who will cast all his and our enemies into everlasting condemnation, but will take us and all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joy and glory. Our Father, may we all be drawn by you to serve the Lamb, that this prayer may be the language of all our hearts. Amen. In Christ alone my hope is found. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. 
till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ. I'll stand. Our thanks to Lynn Burns from Finney Cash, who will now lead us in praise. today. I hope that you have enjoyed the word of God and have found it helpful. I'm now going to close with the words of the benediction and the doxology found in Revelation chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.